Good evening, everybody. It's it's so good to see all of you. I hope everyone's doing well. Um, uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to tonight's program titled Understanding COVID-19 and Developing Coping Strategies. And as you all know, this gathering was designed by Beth Ams Health Initiative, which creates opportunities for members of our congregation who are healthcare professionals, to come together for shared learning, networking, and friendship building. The Health Initiative also offers health-related education programs like tonight's for the congregation at large, thereby fulfilling the Jewish mandate to care for our health as a sacred responsibility. On a, on a more personal note, and um, as a relative newcomer to our congregation, uh, what, what particularly excites me about tonight is how it's such a great example of how our congregation really harnesses the expertise and wisdom of our own members in the educational processes of our congregation. And so I'm thrilled that we've got such a like incredible group of people about to present to us uh, based on, on a, a very deep knowledge base, and I'm excited to learn from them. So I, I want to turn the proceedings now over to Diane, Diana Guthoner, who is serving as the moderator for tonight's panel. Diana. It's great to be with you all, and I'm excited to hear from our panel of experts. Um, I actually need to do. Excited to hear from our panel of experts. Before we get started, I'd like to extend a special thanks to Laurie Holzberg, who went with the idea, followed through, got this illustrious panel of experts together and organized us all for this evening. Also, Many thanks to our technical experts, Steve Lazarus and Lauren Ford, who make this all possible. Please enter the, your questions into the chat box and Laurie and myself will address them and direct them to the panel. It is my privilege to introduce my distinguished colleagues. Dr. Art Bobrov, Adjunct Professor of Medicine, Immunology, Rheumatology, Stanford University Medical Center. Ross Dehovitz, MD, Pediatrician, Immunization Committee Chair, Palo Alto Medical Foundation. Dr. Devin Prouty, Licensed Psychologist, Senior Research Psychologist at SRI, International Human Sleep Research Lab and Peggy Pizzo, Director, Early Learning Project, Stanford Graduate School of Education. By way of introduction to this evening, I'd like to set the stage with a brief overview of where we are now and try to put it all into perspective using broad strokes and then turn it over to the experts to give us a more complete discussion. I think it's important to remember that the coronavirus disease 2019 has spread globally at a rapid pace. It was first reported in late December 2019 and declared a pandemic by WHO on March 11, 2020. It is an unprecedented historic pandemic 100 years after the Spanish flu and will need to be prepared for further pandemics which will be inevitable. It has spread rapidly because it is so highly contagious with considerable associated morbidity and mortality. We are familiar with the coronavirus causing common cold symptoms, but as a novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2 is unique, even mysterious, confusing, and we continue to learn every day about it and the disease it produces a disease with an amazing spectrum of severity from asymptomatic carriers disproportionately leaning towards younger people 
to mildly ill with symptoms of an upper respiratory tract infection, to those that require hospitalization for supportive management of acute hypoxic respiratory failure, to those with severe fulminant disease, necessitating intensive care with severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute respiratory failure, thromboembolic complications, multi-organ failure, life-threatening sepsis, and even death. As we learn about this disease, we are seeing long-term post-viral symptoms, even after the virus clears, continued fatigue, lethargy, embolic phenomena, myocarditis, brain fog, depression, even PTSD, and what are called long haul symptoms. Interestingly, children have milder symptoms, predominantly limited to the upper respiratory tract, but a small percentage develop a severe disease or even a multi-system inflammatory syndrome. During these past 10 months, we have all redefined our lives. Our aim must be that everyone will get back to a degree of normality, which resembles where we were prior to COVID, either with a safe and efficacious vaccine or acquired natural immunity following an infection, aiming to achieve herd immunity levels of over 70%. From the time the Chinese published the genetic sequence on January 10th, and NIH produced it and three days later, vaccines were being developed. And now the first vaccines are already arriving with discussions underway and their rollout in an efficient and equitable way. But we have to remember, it'll still take time. We'll be hearing a lot more about vaccines from Dr. Dehovitz. We have come a long way in these past 10 months with development of effective treatments in the interim. We have dexamethasone and the first approved coronavirus antiviral treatment remdesivir, both for the critically ill patients, together with advances in intensive care supportive treatment, such as proning the patient and using lower tidal volumes for respiratory support. But for the early uncomplicated disease where it is so important to prevent the progression of the infection landing the patient in hospital, there is still much excitement about such treatments as monoclonal antibodies, interferon, and convalescent serum. We'll be hearing more about these treatments from Dr. Bob Rove. We all have to make tough decisions, how to balance our desire to live our lives against our tolerance for risk against COVID. We'll be hearing more about secondary consequences of shutdown from Dr. Prouty and Peggy Pizzo. The primary methods of COVID-19 pandemic control are universal facial masking, distancing, good hygiene, avoiding crowds and super spreader events, testing and contact tracing. If we do these simple standard public health measures, we can blunt the surges and open the economy prudently until we get a substantial proportion of the population vaccinated. Masking is crucial in dampening transmission and may even reduce severity of disease. With COVID-19 cases accelerating or plateauing throughout much of the world, we need to capture the infected persons, whether asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic carriers, while they are still infectious so they will be filtered out of the population and prevent spread to others, specifically limiting asymptomatic spread. Tests called rapid lateral flow antigen tests provide a cheap, simple test that can be performed frequently to offset its inferior sensitivity. They can provide effective surveillance of the entire population and control the ongoing pandemic. This should complement the standard clinically definitive, highly sensitive PCR test used to pinpoint who is infected. First slide, Lauren, please. The number of cases, oh, oops.
the number of cases here in the United States had a second peak in late July and early August, then after a downward trend is now rising explosively across the country into a third wave. The dip at the end and the right is thought artifactual due to the Thanksgiving holiday and limited testing over the holiday. You can see also the increase in the number of deaths on the lower curve. As of today, there have been over 15 million total cases in the United States and more than 280,000 deaths. Next slide, please, uh, Lauren. In California, a similar curve with a surge in cases beginning in November and continuing into December with almost 1.3 million cases. Just last Wednesday, as the state had a seven day average positive test rate increased to 7.3%, the state had 116 deaths. 99% of the counties in California now are within the purple tier, the highest tier, that is above 7% positive test rate, seven being the magic number, with Marin being the outlier. With the rising number of hospital and ICU beds in use since November, a practical measure you'll hear now is the number of available ICU beds. Last week, there were 1,810 ICU beds available in the state with full capacity projected by the 14th of December and over capacity by Christmas of 112%. Last slide, uh, Lauren. This is a striking graph, which is, I thought, worthwhile to show you. You can see that in France, where there was a large surge in cases, now after really a relatively low uh, rate in the summer months, like all of uh, most of Europe, but here is a country that managed to make the epidemic drop precipitously and with stringent public health measures, you can see in the right, they were able to control that surge. Let's get to the presentations. Dr. Bob Rove is no stranger to the Beth Arm community. He is speaking first and will give a summary on how the virus attacks the body and the immune system and how the medical community is dealing with the disease and what tools it needs to deal with the disease. Thank you, Art. Thank you, uh, Rabbi Morrison, and thank you, Diana. Well, thank you, and as uh, Diana uh, expressed, we're in a, a major surge. In fact, it's very frightening for uh, physicians that are taking care of pa uh, patients with um, uh, COVID-19 in hospital. Um, I was uh, going to start by saying these are the worst of times and these are the best of times, but in fact, these are the worst of times and they're even more worse than times because of what we're seeing. Um, this is the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the organism that causes the uh, disease we call COVID-19. And as, since it's predominantly a airborne disease and affects the upper and potentially the lower respiratory tract, here is a lung cell from a patient showing infection with thousands of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Now, what happens when someone is exposed to uh, the, the virus? On day zero, they're exposed. On day one and two, the virus is multiplying, but their test is likely to be negative. By day three, the test turns positive because there is enough viral load, but they may not yet be infectious. But day four, they're infectious and able to spread the virus. And by day five and six, they become symptomatic and continue to be infectious. And that continues on for one or two weeks until they're no longer symptomatic. And then after about 10 days, they're unlikely to be able to transmit the disease if they're asymptomatic and afebrile. Around the 10th day, they start to produce 
antibodies directed against the virus. Some of these are binding antibodies, not necessarily neutralizing antibodies. But we've also learned that some patients, now this is the mean or average course, but there are patients who are symptomatic within two days of exposure, or they may not be symptomatic and for 14 days after exposure. So there's a wide variation. Now, it's a very complex and variable disease. And in fact, 80% of infected patients have no or only mild symptoms. And is within this cohort that 50% of so-called super spreaders come from. So you could see that how difficult it would be to um, contact tracing of patients who are infected because you don't know if you were in a group who had people spreading it but were not symptomatic or particularly if you're in multiple locations. And that's seemingly what's been happening. The majority with mild symptoms usually recover with one to two weeks, within one to two weeks. Although 35% of adults can take at least three weeks to recover, and 20% of healthy infected youngsters ages 18 to 34 may have symptoms for at least three weeks or longer. Now, moderate symptoms as defined by shortness of breath and an abnormal chest X-ray, they can or cannot have fever, but they have a normal oxygen saturation by the pulse oximeter that people have been advised to get. And those patients usually have symptoms for at least a month. Now, severe disease recovery may take six weeks or longer. Now, you can go from becoming being asymptomatic and to mild and then advance on to moderate or severe. But severe disease is not uncommonly found in patients who are elderly or have a, a high body mass index, have diabetes, heart disease, or chronic lung disease, asthma, et cetera. Now, it's a complex multi-system disease. As I said, it is predominantly airborne and involves the respiratory tract. It can spread in, to a pneumonia. In mild or moderate disease, it would be kind of like a walking pneumonia, but if it spreads and becomes more severe, then it can cause what we call severe acute respiratory syndrome or SARS and involve other organs, including the heart, the heart muscle, the nervous system, liver, gastrointestinal tract, kidneys, skin, eyes, and blood vessels. Blood clots have been known to occur more frequently than would be expected from simply pneumonia involving the lungs, but also the brain and heart and other organs. And of course, multi-organ system failure can occur and lead to death or shock can result. Now, there are stages of this disease, and this is what has led to confusion about how the medicines that have been prescribed may or may not seem effective in various trials. But we now appreciate that the first uh, stage or stage one is the viral stage. The virus invades the respiratory tract predominantly and it has a course and then it is uh, affected by the immune system. And if it's mild, it dissipates quickly and patients are recovered. But if it's ongoing and the immune system is activated excessively, you can get what's called a hyper response on the part of the patient. Now, what is our immune system doing in, in the setting of uh, COVID-19? Well, the first uh, immune system is called the innate immune system and it it is a, um, established in all um, organisms have uh, an innate immune system. It's nonspecific. And it's like a, the light cavalry, so to speak. It's supposed to produce factors like interferon, which has the capacity to signal uh, neighboring cells that there's an infection going on, and also to signal cells that are infected 
to actually program them to die so that the virus can't reproduce. And it also produces factors we call cytokines that affect the virus and can cause activated cells to kill the virus directly. Then we have the adaptive immune system, which is activated after the innate immune system, particularly if it doesn't mop up all the virus. And it produces cytokines also, but cells form a memory so that the body recognizes through their adaptive immune system this virus. So if you, if you get exposed again, you would have a prompt response and a more effective response. But as I said, with disease intensity, you can have too much of this because it's almost like this is a um, heavy artillery, so to speak, and the, the cytokine storm issue can occur. And when we see patients in the hospital who have to be uh, in intensive care unit because they have a severe uh, acute respiratory syndrome, we find that their cells that are supposed to be attacking the virus, so-called lymphocytes, are exhausted and depleted. And in older patients, they already have insufficient naive lymphocytes. So they don't, they're able, not able to mount an effective uh, response. And that leads to severe uh, disease and even demise. Now, what's the treatment and how does it occur? Well, it depends upon the phase or stage of the disease to be effective. We know that monoclonal neutralizing antibodies are most effective while the virus is still infecting the patient. Uh, or even hopefully before patients are even infected as a preventative, although it's a very expensive drug and needs to be administered intravenously. Remdesivir has been the first drug used to diminish the ability of the virus to replicate or reproduce. But we know that when it's given in the hospital, particularly if the patient is severely ill, it hasn't proved as effective because it has no effect on the uh, hyperimmune response. And so it hasn't looked as effective until recently. When combined with a drug called baricitinib, which has gotten recent approval by the FDA, this works on the remedir, remdesivir works on the virus, the baricitinib works on the hyperimmune response and together they can uh, help the patient recover. And of course, dexamethasone has been very effective in reducing the immune response and it's cheap and it's been used uh, extensively for other uh, uh, entities. So it's well known and it works in people who are severely ill and require oxygen. And of course, some patients need to be on anticoagulants. There are many medicines in the works None of them have been approved yet, but we're certainly hopeful for inhalers that can be used both to prevent the disease and for uh, early treatment, particularly inhalation of remdesivir, which is being studied in a clinical trial. What are modifiable risk factors that we can do? Well, influenza vaccination is essential for everybody, including the children in the household. This helps to avoid co-infection. Or if you get infected with influenza and are exposed to COVID, your immune system is already suppressed and that would be quite uh, deleterious for the patient. Smoking is a definite uh, disadvantage for people who get infected. Excessive alcohol use. It's important to have adequate vitamin D levels and if need be taking supplements, but this should be managed by your physician. And the chronic use of proton pump inhibitors, such as Prilosec, can actually enhance the effect of the virus. Uh, because actually gastric acid is great at killing the virus, but if you take a potent proton pump inhibitor, it can reduce that acidity. Now the CDC preventive measures, they're you know not rocket science. Practice physical distancing at least six feet between individuals and stay in your household bubble. Wear a face covering and I wear it all the time. I, I don't wear it to bed, but I 
keep it in case I have to take the dog out. I'm sure I have it and I can put it on. Wash your hands thoroughly and frequently whenever you're out uh, and come back in and avoid gatherings of any size with people who are not part of the household and stay home if you are sick and avoid unnecessary travel. Limit your outings to essential tasks. These are critical measures that will control things. And unfortunately, our uh, population are not following the, these guidelines. The solution ultimately is effective and safe vaccines along with sensible compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you, Art, that was terrific. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Ross de Hobart, who will discuss immunity of children and vaccine development for COVID. Thank you, Dr. de Hobart's. Hello, um, let me just share my screen here. Okay. Well, so um, thank you for that introduction. And uh, just to extend Art's metaphor a little farther, I call this the most hopeful of times because um, we have a lot of things uh, that are coming up, especially this week. Um, it's hard to believe, but um, uh, we, uh, the first shots were given in England today. And, um, and uh, on Thursday, we'll have a presentation in front of the FDA. And by next week, who knows, the first shots will be given in the United States. So a lot of excitement coming in the next few days. Um, let's talk about this amazing development in 11 months from January 10th to now, where we have some uh, possible candidate vaccines and how we got here and where we go from here. Typically, it takes years to make a vaccine. The previous record was months at four years. Um, how do you make a vaccine during a global pandemic that avoids shortcuts? Um, hold on uh, one second, there we go. Well, there are four major steps to vaccine development. First of all, is it technically feasible to make? Um, will the vaccine response be protective? The FDA wants it to be at least 50% effective. Um, is, is there an acceptable side effect profile? Generally, you need 15,000 to 30,000 patients in a placebo controlled trial to reveal any safety issues. And then can you mass produce it with the right buffer agents, the right stabilizing agent, the right vials? Will it be stable over time and distance? Let's look at the types of vaccines. And this list is sort of gives you a whole idea of the history of vaccines from smallpox to the present. Originally, we had killed virus vaccines like the soft polio vaccine. You just, you kill the virus and then you inject it and the body then learns how to recognize the virus in case it's, it encounters a live virus. The live attenuated viruses like MMR or varicella vaccine, weakened viruses that when your body gets as a vaccine can then learn how to recognize when it encounters the wild type. And then we learn how to make subunit viral vaccines. These are, these are vaccines that we just get that part of the, vac of the virus that you really need to create immunity. So they learn how to do this with hepatitis B, with zoster, that's, uh, that's shingles, and that's that Shingrix vaccine that just came out a few years ago. And HPV vaccine is also a subunit viral vaccine. And then there's a, a relatively new technology called viral vector vaccine, where they use a harmless adenovirus that makes spike protein on a surface uh, to stimulate the immunity. The spike protein is that part of the coronavirus that, uh, um, that, that uh, um, it makes it so distinct. Well, if you just have this harmless adenovirus make the spike protein, you can, you can do the same thing as giving a killed version of the, of the coronavirus. And then there's um, the newest technology, injecting pure RNA or injecting pure DNA. And that provides the instructions for the cell the, um, to make the viral protein, such as the spike protein. Uh, that we're seeing now with these two vaccines that are coming out soon. The advantages are you need very little material, very fast to make, which is why we could do it in, uh, in just a few months. But the disadvantages, it has a very short expiration date, and that's why you've been hearing about the, the deep freeze that many of these, um, that, that these Pfizer uh, vaccine needs uh, in order to store it. Um, so what are the leading candidates? Uh, the RNA vaccines, those are the two that are out uh, coming out in the next few weeks. The Pfizer-BioNTech one is in review with the FDA. That's two doses, 21 days apart. Um, that's uh, going to be reviewed this Thursday. 
Um, Moderna in review with the FDA next Thursday, a week from now. Um, that's two doses, 28 days apart. Um, there are a couple of adenovirus vaccines that are being studied. The University of Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, it's in currently in phase three studies right now. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine, um, that's in phase three studies right now. And that, that may only require one dose and that will, uh, that, that could be a game changer if, it, if that really does come out because one dose uh, is a big deal uh, instead of two doses. And then there's a protein subunit vaccine that's being studied by Novavax in the, in the UK right now. And there are many others as well. So what are these phases of vaccine studies? I mean, um, it, it, just, just to briefly show you what, what, the, what, the studies, what the phases are, phase one is given to about 10 or 20 people to see if it generates an immune response. Does this actually technology even work? Phase two, it's given to about 100 or so to figure out the optimal dosing and uh, the vaccine production specifications. Um, phase three, which is what uh, we just, uh, we're in the middle of right now, you give it to 15 to 30,000 of the population intended for the vaccine. This will help identify those rare side effects that would not be seen in smaller studies. If it's placebo controlled, then we hopefully will identify how protective the vaccine is compared to those getting placebo. Then the FDA will consider licensure based on these studies and the CDC will then recognize, recommend which groups should get the vaccine and provide a recommendation for everybody, whether it's seniors or children or whatever. And then the phase four studies are the post licensure studies. And that's as you now go up to, a, to millions of people getting the vaccine, you then look for for other, um, other, other effects that you may not be able to pick up with the, uh, with the smaller studies. Let's talk about safety. Paul Offit says this, it's never a matter of when you know everything. The question is, when do you know enough? It really is impractical to wait years and years for side effects in the middle of a pandemic, but you need to know what you don't know. Right now, we won't know how long it protects for. We won't know that until later. And we really won't know initially if there are extremely rare side effects but we have mechanisms in place to pick them up. Um, and so this is a safety surveillance program that'll happen after licensure. There's already this program called VAERS, you may have heard about it, you know, that's V-A-E-R-S, Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System. It's a passive reporting system. Anybody can report it. It's national, it's run by the FDA and CDC, and you, you can do it online or by paper. And it just creates a whole list of anybody's reported side effects. And what CDC and FDA do is they, they look for signals. Are there, are there more heart attacks than you, than you would expect or more strokes than you would expect? And if they see a signal, then they can then look at that more closely. The Vaccine Safety Data Link is an active reporting system. This is a, the CDC working with eight integrated systems like Kaiser's around the country um, who have a, a set denominator of patients and then they look for signals in their group as well. And uh, that's another mechanism for looking for safety issues. And then with this particular COVID vaccine program, there's something called vSafe. In the beginning, people who get the COVID vaccine in the very early stages are gonna have this smartphone-based surveillance text system. And what you'll do is every day it'll prompt you, do you have a fever today? Or do you have a, um, anything? And you write down yes or no what the temperature is or whatever. And then it'll prompt you once a day for a week and then prompt you once a week for six weeks. And the idea here is that this will also be another way of, um, of, of, of surveilling for, for issues um, going forward. So what's happening this week, the FDA is gonna vote shortly on the EUA. The EUA is an emergency use authorization because the studies have, are not finished. So they're gonna go for this program called the emergency use authorization. In order for an EUA, you have to have a declaration by the HHS secretary of an emergency situation leading to life-threatening disease or condition. You need to have enough data where the benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. And then you need to have no available alter alternatives. And this all fits what we currently are going through right now with COVID. Now, this is a list of sort of the groups that are thought to be early on in terms of who will get the vaccine early while we ramp up supply. Healthcare personnel, essential workers at 80 million, um, adults 65 and over at 53 million, and people with high risk medical conditions. This is the, these are the groups that, that are going to be uh, getting it earlier. And, and, and so this is a graph showing you sort of how the typical ramp up of any vaccine program goes. And this is this period right here where you'll be, they'll be where doses are gonna be limited. And so how do you decide who gets that first? And this is where um, uh, the, FD, the, the CDC has recommended healthcare personnel and people in long-term care facilities will get it first. And then moving on to the other groups um, as we get more supply. And this, this section, there'll be large number of doses available and then there'll be continued vaccination over here where supply does meet demand. Here's another way of looking at this is the interim sequence 
Phase 1A is healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. Phase 1B are essential workers. Phase 1C, adults with high-risk mental conditions and adults 65 and over. And, and this is all proposed. It's not finalized yet, but this is what they're looking at, again, to, to ease in over, over time. Now, you may have heard of this um, mRNA vaccine. It's what's coming. It's what we're dealing with right now with these two new vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. What is that technology? It's when we have the, the mRNA injected into the cell, um, what, what do we know about it? Well, the technology is new, but it's not unknown. These vaccines have been used for a decade, providing um, vaccines for influenza, Zika, and rabies. Also, it's been used in cancer to stimulate immune responses to tumors. They do not carry a live virus. They pose no risk of causing the disease in the vaccinated person. And the mRNA from the vaccine never enters the nucleus of the cell and does not interact with the person's DNA. Let's just look quickly at the Pfizer vaccine. That's the one that's gonna probably be uh, approved first. In, in this most recent study um, that's uh, being looked at, uh, 40,000 people, we have um, 170 people in the study developed COVID disease. Of that, 162 developed disease in the, in the placebo group and only eight in the vaccinated group, which gives you a 95% vaccine efficacy. And that efficacy in seniors is 94%. Um, the Moderna vaccine um, that is going to be reviewed next week, they reported a whole 196 total cases of COVID, 185 in the placebo group, 11 in the um, mRNA vaccine group. That's a 94.1% vaccine, uh, percent app vaccine efficacy. And of the 30 severe cases of COVID that were presented in the study, they were all in the placebo group. So um, again, that's, that all does speak well for this technology. So what were the side effects? Well, this was in the uh, phase one, phase two trial, but it's basically been reflected in the uh, big trial that just got reported today. So it's pretty much the same kind of things that, that, that were reported earlier. Generally, they're, they're well tolerated, but most people felt something. The second dose is worse than the first dose, less side effects in the elderly, uh, for some reason, the elderly with their immune system not quite as high, as active as younger people just don't react as badly um, as uh, the younger, younger populations. And there's no serious uncommon side effect um, within two months after the, after the second dose. Now, there are the side effects and the local side effects. There's pain at the injection site. And the systemic effects that people felt were fever, fatigue, headache, chills. Most were mild to moderate. Moderate means some interference with activity. Um, uh, and, and severe ones would be things that we have to take a day off or, from work or day off from, from what you normally do. So mild to moderate is thought to be very, very, very manageable. And this is the Moderna side effect profile, very similar to the uh, Pfizer pro uh, profile. Again, the key thing here to see is vaccination two were more, more side effects than vaccination one. So here are the conclusions. Both mRNA vaccines appear to have high efficacy against COVID-19 disease. Rollout of these vaccines will begin this month and proceed into 2021. Side effects are common, but generally well tolerated. And over time, we'll learn whether booster doses are needed. Um, I'm gonna stop my sharing and let you guys uh, go back there. All right. That was great, relevant and timely, huh? That was terrific. Thank you very much. The next is Devin, Dr. Devin Prouty, who's going to discuss how shelter in place orders and distance learning are impacting children, teens and families, and uh, their sleep patterns and distance learning in teens. Thank you, Devon. You're right. Thank you, Diana. Uh, let me see if I can get my slides up here and then I'll get started. Okay. So th Thank you everybody for coming today. Um, it's great to see all of you virtually out there. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple of different topics. And first I wanna talk a little bit about um, the impact of shelter in place on sleep in children and teens. This is something that um, I do some research on at SRI International and I, I have experience with in my private practice. And so um, we actually were able to uh, deploy some research studies uh, right after the shelter in place began to collect data from groups of teens that were already enrolled in, in some studies that we were doing. And what we found is that uh, teens are going to sleep later, getting up later, and um, actually following their natural circadian rhythm shift. Um, 
which may have some benefits actually. Uh, this is how teenagers are generally supposed to sleep and later school start times also are facilitating this and allowing them to sort of follow a more natural sleep pattern. Um, on the other hand, for some children, uh, we're having, they're having some problems with sleep and that could be due to a number of different things related to shelter in place. So we know that exercise, getting a lot of activity during the day is really important for, for good sleep. Um, increased screen time, we know that that has a potential to decrease uh, the ability to fall asleep quickly. And, that, and all of us, uh, including our children, are, are most likely getting increased screen time. And one of the biggest factors is this, the increased stressors across the family and that all, all of us are experiencing. Um, and we know that stress has a negative impact on sleep. I'm gonna talk later about how we can moderate some of these negative impacts. And um, right now I'm gonna move on to the, the next thing that I wanted to talk a little bit about, which is how distance learning is, is impacting our children. Um, so like sleep, there are some potentially good things and some potentially negative things about distance learning. So one of the biggest factors that we are seeing that we're going to have to deal with um, for our children is social and emotional learning. This is a, such a huge part of school for children through all grades and all age ranges. Um, our kids don't usually get graded for social emotional learning, but it's a big, big part of what happens at school and what are some of the benefits of school. And so that's really changing with distance learning. Um, another thing that we're seeing is decreased identification of abuse and neglect. School teachers, uh, provide a large proportion of the mandated reporting of abuse and neglect that happens in the state and across this country. And because those teachers don't have uh, direct access to their students, they're, they're not able to identify uh, these problems and therefore not able to report them. And, and we're worried about the long-term effects of that and how that might impact uh, those children that are experiencing these difficult situations. We're also seeing widened disparities um, in education. And we already know a lot that there are a lot of disparities in ed education in California and across the nation. Um, and those can be based on income, language, uh, documentation status, special needs. And we're seeing that many of those um, disparities are being increased uh, by distance learning. So for example, a lack of access to good Wi-Fi or computers or technology, things like that. On the other hand, some children are really thriving. Um, there can be benefits to distance learning. For some children, it can help them um, with reduced distractions, uh, quieter learning environments. Uh, they, they, some children find an increased ability to sort of focus and concentrate on schoolwork, um, it, a reduction in some social anxiety that may occur at school. So, so there are some kids who are benefiting and there are some, some good things that may come out of distance learning. I, I suspect that when all this is over, we're gonna learn some lessons and, and school may change because we'll have new tools to use. Um, in addition to some of those benefits, we do know that online learning does work where there's research done prior to COVID-19 that shows that online learning can be a very effective uh, model for, for teaching. Um, but that is different from remote learning, um, but we, we do know that it, it can work. And one of the other real problems that we're seeing is increased teacher burnout. As we all know, our teachers are working so, so hard to provide great education for our students and it's really, really difficult. So that's that's a challenge for them. So let's talk now about how, ways that we can help uh, students, uh, our, our children, our grandchildren, and things that we might, might be able to do um, to support them. So regarding sleep, well, we want to help our children uh, follow a good sleep hygiene. And, and a couple of things that lead to that are having a routine, uh, reducing electronics prior to bedtime, no screens in the bedroom, um, preserve the bed for sleeping only. We really want to make that space just for sleeping. So we want to encourage our children and teens to, to do homework, watch movies, play video games, use social media, um, 
read books. Uh, well, reading books is kind of okay, but any other activities, we want them to do it out of the bed so that the bed is really just the place where your body associates uh, with sleep. Um, exercise, so important for so many uh, uh, aspects of our health, mental health, physical health, everything. Find ways to help your children uh, get exercise, whether it's walking, biking, yoga, any sport that they enjoy, anything that they will do really is what's important, whatever is enjoyable. Sometimes making this a family activity is a great way to combine several of these support uh, mechanisms into one thing, because a lot of times when kids are walking, uh, it's a great time to talk and, and have conversations uh, more so than sort of a face to face conversation. Kids don't usually go for that as much. Socialization, as we mentioned, uh, that's a big part of normal school and something that's lacking in some ways. So um, let's, let's think about ways to help our children get uh, socialization. And they can do that through online learning, through the breakout groups in the school. And, and it's different, but it is a form of socialization. Um, other programs, online programs and, and distance programs, for example, the Betham educational programs, a great way for kids to, to get socialization with peers and, and other adults who are supportive and going to be helping them. Um, and this is a real kind of a new thing for me. For the first time, I'm recommending to families um, social media and video games. Usually I, I'm talking with families about how these are problematic and how they can moderate these things. And that can still be the case that they could pose problems. But we are seeing that our teens and our middle schoolers are really utilizing social media and video games to socialize sometimes in positive or often positive ways. Now, hopefully this is done with uh, adult supervision and monitoring so that it is positive, um, but this is a, a viable way for kids and uh, teens, boys and girls to, to interact over Discord, over video games, over social media. And it might be really valuable in this time where the normal socialization is just not there. Um, other, the other thing is physically distant, safe activities, um, which that definition is, you know, somewhat changing. Um, but you know, there are physically distant, safe activities that we can do, whether that's, uh, uh, physically distant walks with friends with masks on, um, or whatever other types of activities that we can do that are safe, physically distant, following all the guidelines, um, that we heard about earlier. Another thing that I find important for our children, but also for myself, is a news or information diet. Um, the news can provide a lot of stress to us and to our children. And when I say a diet, what I mean by that is uh, it's good to be informed. It's good to know what's happening in the world. But much of the news, the way it's designed and, and put forth to us these days is really sensationalized and not necessarily helpful. So um, I kind of look at it as a, a tiered system. I, I find that video programs are the most sensationalized with the most audio and stimulating, uh, you know, violent video images. Um, audio news programs, whether it be radio or podcasts are usually better. You can control them more. There's less violent imagery and things like that. And then uh, print information can be really great. And there are a lot of ways that you can do this for yourself and for your kids. There are great apps um, on smartphones and podcasts that provide uh, great news summaries without all the sensationalized uh, video and imagery. Um, and that can be a great way to reduce the stress in your life and for your children, but stay informed and know what's happening in the world. Empowerment. Um, allow our children to struggle. It, it shows that we have faith and trust in their resilience. And this is really important. Of course, there are times where we need to step in and support them and help them, but allowing them to solve problems on their own is so powerful and so empowering to them. A, a great source of information on how to do this is a, a wonderful book that I really, really love by Wendy Mogul called The Blessings of a Skin Knee that talks about this model of empowering our children by letting them struggle appropriately. 
Um, it also follows a, 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 a Jewish framework. It's a really great book that I recommend for all people that interact with children. And lastly, I wanna talk about leading by example. So we have great power to influence the children in our lives, even when they don't show it. Rarely are they gonna to turn to parents or, or grandparents and say, gee, mom, you are so wise. I wanna be more like you. But truly they are watching and they are listening. So um, follow these recommendations yourselves if you think that it's important for your children to do so. Getting sleep, getting exercise, um, taking care of yourself is modeling for your children how to take care of themselves. Um, ask questions of them, even when you don't get answers. Keep asking the questions. It's showing that you care and you, can, you have concern about them and they really are listening. They're picking up on those things. So that's a really powerful tool that we all have. Thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna turn it uh, back over to Diana and- That was terrific, lots of information. Terrific, thanks a lot, Devin. The final speaker is Peggy Pizzo. She'll discuss issues for families and young children with the stress of working from home, inadequate childcare and intergenerational dynamics, not being able to see grandparents and other family members who act as support systems. Thank you, Peggy. I look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you, Diana. <clears throat> So I'm going to turn to Lauren Ford uh, to help me with the slides. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so I'm, we're going to look at challenges, but also solutions to the social and emotional health of young children. These would be children from birth to eight. Uh, so it's a compliment to Dr. Prouty. Uh, he was looking at middle schoolers and above. Now we're going to look at the population uh, eight and below. Um, may I have the next slide, please? Uh, the only data we have thus far is really from China, which preceded us, of course, uh, with COVID. And there was a, one study uh, of 2,330 school children, uh, mostly young ones, in Hubei province, where children had been quarantined uh, for an average of 33.7 uh, days, almost 34 days. And um, the impact uh, was shown in the next slide. And it's something that some of us are familiar with. 22.6% of the children reported depressive symptoms, even young ones. 18.9% uh, reported experiencing anxiety. Um, so this is to frame for us, if you're experiencing this in your children, uh, this is normal, it's typical of experiences during a, a pandemic and quarantine in particular and the isolation that goes with it. Next slide, please, Lauren. There are studies that looked at previous uh, pandemics and isolation and at the impact of school and childcare closures. So an NIH, NIH review of 24 of these studies noted, of course, economic harm to working parents and to society, which produces stress, learning loss among children, even among younger children, uh, the harm to child welfare that Dr. Prady mentioned, um, particularly most, among the most vulnerable young children and nutritional problems especially in children for whom uh, childcare and school are a source of free meals and a particularly important source of nutrition. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, what is most important for children, young children, uh, are adults, particularly parents and grandparents. Um, so what do we see about the psychological impact of previous quarantine? And here again, a review of 24 studies that was published in Lancet in 2020 showed a range of negative impacts, including depression, stress, insomnia, post-traumatic stress symptoms, anger, and emotional exhaustion. Um, could we go to the next slide, please, Lauren? 
uh, there's a particular sort of subset of children which and adults who may have had previous um, predisposition to PTSD. Maybe they've had traumatic experiences in the past. So there is an NIH, again, an NIH synthesis of research on the psychological impact of pandemic related quarantine with a particular focus on uh, trauma and PTSD found that 28% of the parents quarantined in a particular UCLA study warranted, um, uh, had symptoms that warranted a diagnosis of trauma-related mental health disorder. Isolated and quarantined children met the criteria for PTSD at rates close to children who have experienced natural disasters like earthquakes and floods and hurricanes. Um, so this is likely to be much more prevalent in children whose neurodiversity or whose previous uh, experiences of trauma might predispose them to experiencing more PTSD-like symptoms. Could I have the next slide, please? So what helps adults uh, who are the most important in young children's lives? Six strategies. Um, and I want to call out in particular uh, the um, Beth Alm leadership for already observing many of these. Um, communities of adult support generally, uh, parenting and grandparenting support groups. And we have in particular here an example with a member of our Beth Alm, Uriela Ben Yaakov, is very involved in hand in hand parenting. And the link will give you. Uh, access to information about that. Uh, it's a great source of parent-to-parent -parent support. Oriella and I are talking about it uh, becoming a great source of grandparent-to-grandparent -grandparent support as well. A telephone support line um, and a personally meaningful spiritual framework for adults. Uh, again, Beth Alm has shown us the way on all of this. Uh, outdoor time, sleep, social support, exercise, good nutrition, and meditation, as Dr. Prady has already recognized for teens as well as for adults. Professional and pastoral counseling and guidance. And here we have uh, to shout out and thank our rabbis, but also the many peer-to-peer -peer support counseling activities that are underway at Beth Am. Could we go to the next slide, please? What helps children who are particularly vulnerable at young ages, and that is children with special needs. And there are four strategies. Again, I'm going to go back to parent and grandparent support, and I'm going to call out a Beth Am committee called INCLUDE, led by Steve Bauman and Melissa Kelly. Um, and uh, if you have an interest in uh, children or adults with special needs, uh, join include. Uh, there is also uh, a video-based technology that reduces children's fear and anger. It's called MITER. It was developed by Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. Um, counseling, uh, particularly specialized counseling around uh, the areas of neurodiversity and children with special needs, uh, and that would include family counseling. And then finally, uh, pet therapy, uh, to the extent that children can get access safely to dogs or other kinds of pets, uh, this can be a great source of calming and self-soothing for them. Uh, Lauren, could we go to the next slide? So grandparents are particularly important here, uh, and I'm one of them. We buffer stress. We buffer stress in our adult children and we buffer stress in our grandchildren. So how do we do that when we are confined at home? Uh, well, we become innovative. And there are three strategies that I particularly want to call out. One is to seek your own medical practitioner's advice uh, regarding different strategies for in-person interaction with young children. Um, you know, technology is great, but if our own physicians feel that we can do things outdoors 
with our grandchildren with some social distance there. Uh, if we can do things with special kinds of glass or plexiglass barriers um, in between us, but they can still, you know, really see us. Um, or if we can create a household bubble safely that does involve grandchildren and grandparents as well as the children's parents. Uh, this is all individualized. This Dr. Barbara has already shown us uh, and until the vaccine come, uh, which as Dr. Hovitz has shown us is coming, we need to go to our own medical practitioners. Um, I wanna encourage us all to master new technology and just uh, take a growth mindset to this, that it's good for not only our interactions with our grandchildren, but it's good for probably elder brain health as well, keeps the synaptic connections going. <clears throat> Seeking help with mastering technology is another good strategy for grandparents and I wanna suggest here a community service intergenerational role for Betham teens and for Betham young adults uh, as a way of providing those of us who are relatively new to technology with Zoom or Skype tutors or FaceTime tutors from this part of our Betham community. They're usually tech whizzes as we know. Um, could I have the next uh, slide please? Here are some additional sources for you as parents or grandparents, links to Bing Nursery School, a fabulous resource, Kadango, also a great resource for ideas and activities. This is the next one is the Children's Health Council, particularly great for parents and grandparents of children uh, who have special needs or, or neurodiversity. The Children's Partnership based in LA, also good. National Association for the Education of Young Children, also a great resource and of course the American Academy of Pediatrics. So with that, uh, I thank you very much for your um, attention and attunement. And um, uh, th thank you, uh, Diana and Lori for putting this together. Thank you, Peggy, that was terrific. And thank all of the panel. They were really fantastic. And I hope you all agree the presentations were really remarkable. And I applaud you all <laughs> for, uh, and thank you so much. We now have some questions to answer though. Um, and uh, there's a wide range, so that's great. Uh, I'm going to start off with directing a question to Bob, uh, to uh, Art Bob Rove. Why is it important for adults and children to have the flu shot this year? And I think you, you mentioned it, but maybe you can stress it again because it's an important point. Well, for the longest while, it was thought that if you were infected with a virus, you were actually protected from having an infection with another virus at the same time. But we now know that that doesn't really apply, uh, particularly with the COVID virus and with coronaviruses in general. So to have the flu virus and coronavirus simultaneously could be catastrophic. And as I mentioned also, the having influenza um, kind of causes activation of the immune system and then it's kind of fatigued and you don't wanna have a, a tired immune system when you're then exposed to COVID. That's the uh, thought behind being sure that you're protected against, and you can easily be, be protected to, by, uh, by getting a vaccine to the flu. Uh, so that's, that's the rationale for it. And of course, children can it, it transmit it to their grandparents, the flu. There's also the over capacity of the hospitals if we're then land, having to land some influenza patients in there when we already have an over uh, stressed capacity, maybe. Thank you, Art. Sure, good. Um, Judy Abdekar uh, asked this question and I'll direct it to Dr. Dehovitz. In fact, there are a number of uh, questions about the vaccine as you can imagine. So I'll start off with this one. I would like to know if it will be safe to travel to places where they do not have the vaccine if we are vaccinated. Well, um, 
is, uh, you know, this is that's the ultimate question here. I mean, what does it does a vaccine open you up to to suddenly go everywhere you want to go? Uh, you know, as long as a pandemic is raging, you're not going to want to um, have. I mean, you're going to still want to have masks on. You're still going to want to have um, uh, social distancing because the vaccine may, you know, it's it's not won't be a hundred percent protective and although 94% is pretty close, but I, I, don't, I think we'll, we'll learn more with future studies, but I don't think you're gonna wanna um, suddenly say, uh, I'm ready to go uh, after having the vaccine. I think it, you, what, what the idea of the vaccine is that you create herd immunity on lots of people so that the whole burden of disease goes down um, in our country, in our society, and hopefully worldwide. That's terrific. I think you've sort of answered the next ones too, but I'll run it by you One, in, in case you have something additional. Once someone has had a disease, are they truly immune? We don't well, know. Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we know there's some immunity after having the disease. The thought, though, even anybody who, who has had COVID is going to be recommended to get the vaccine as well, because we think the vaccine may actually give a longer immunity. than. The, and we know people with mild disease don't necessarily have a long immunity. So different types of, uh, of COVID infections will produce varying levels of immunity. And we know in other coronaviruses, uh, you don't get a very long immunity. So the thought is that the vaccine would be for everybody, whether you had COVID disease or not. Um, I wonder if I could add something to uh, uh, Art, Art Barbrov's uh, excellent recommendations about the flu vaccine. Um, if you have children who are participating in childcare or preschool, this is really important for both children, parents, and grandparents to get the flu vaccine. Because unfortunately, unlike uh, uh, COVID, children do tend to be super spreaders of influenza. Um, so, and when they're in childcare, they do spread it among one, one another. So really pay attention to that if you have kids who are back at school uh, and childcare. Thank you, Peggy, that's great. Back to Dr. Dehovitz and the uh, vaccines. Realistically, how confident should we be that we will all be vaccinated by the summer? Should we still practice COVID safety measures even after we are vaccinated? And you touched on this already, but way in the game. Yes, uh, we'll have to still be uh, wear, you know, wearing our masks for a while. Um, and, uh, and I think it's going to be dependent on, on what, uh, how to get that disease burden down in our, in our local community, in our state, before we can uh, start to relax things. It's that, that spigot, how well you tighten the spigot and relax the spigot. It will be all dependent on how much COVID is going on around us. This is an interesting question. How were the vaccine trials handled? Were the participants purposefully exposed to COVID or did they just participate in their lives normally? Yes, no, that, there is something called the challenge trial, which there was some debate about whether we should do. And they're talking about doing that in England, but this is not a challenge trial. This is a trial where they gave half, you know, half the 44,000 uh, a, a, the COVID study vaccine and half of them got a placebo, like sugar water or, or saline or that kind of thing. Uh, uh, um, and so um, then they went around their business of just living their lives. And because COVID was in the communities, um, there were a normal amount of people getting COVID uh, in that community that got uh, the vaccines, whether they got placebo or not. And it turned out more people who had placebo um, got COVID disease. And there was a lot more protective, protective effects with the people who got the actual study vaccine. Thank you. Um, the next question is probably for both Devon and Peggy uh, because they don't say what child age group. So we should start with Peggy and then go to Devon. Do you think that opening schools should be a top priority? How could that be accomplished in ensuring that the teachers and staff could be safe? You have to unmute yourself, Peggy. Uh, thanks for the question. I am currently working with uh, Stanford Pediatric Leadership, Dr. Jason Wang, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, uh, to produce a paper on the subject of preschool and childcare. And uh, I can report that the current science is showing that it is safe for children to be in these programs if, and here's the if, 
if the proper precautions are observed. CDC has issued a number of these kinds of precautions. Uh, the local and state public health authorities have as well. Uh, most licensed childcare programs know they have to follow them and are following them. And uh, when they do, uh, and when the impact uh, of COVID rates in the surrounding community is not overwhelming uh, too high, uh, the evidence is suggesting that it is quite safe. Um, but those precautions are essential. And to observe them, childcare and preschool is gonna need a whole lot more money uh, from the federal government and the state and ultimately, we're going to need to make sure that our childcare and preschool teachers get prioritized for the COVID vaccine early, as well as make sure we, that they all get the influenza vaccine. I would just add that it does seem that there is a, an age-based effect, meaning that our older students are probably better equipped to handle remote learning than our youngest students. And that should be factored into the, the equation of opening up um, ultimately the, the science of, of, of transmission and vaccination also will, will dictate that. And the last thing I'd add is that I think that the districts have made an effort in this direction and, and need to be encouraged to really reach out to those who don't have technology or have special needs or other factors that mean um, that they're really losing out uh, from uh, distance learning and, and efforts should be put in place to support those, those children and families that have those needs. There's another question that Devin, you might be able to address. Um, it's from Dr. Jeff uh, Berman. Remote learning, it, it uh, doesn't allow the teacher student to interact to have a spontaneous interaction. Can you comment on that? Well, I certainly think that it varies. Um, again, with age and the structure of the classroom, I know, um, uh, you know, there are many educators who are doing amazing work recreating their entire curricula um, and using, you know, the technology that we're using right now, the kids are, you know, they are able to interact and ask questions and raise hands. And, um, um, and they also have, uh, you know, breakout rooms and, and, and a lot of different features that uh, a lot of really creative educators have utilized to make some really wonderful curricula and learning experiences for children. So um, absolutely, especially last year when all of this sort of was uh, sprung on us in the middle of the school year, it, the quality was, you know, was really, really variable. The districts have done a great job helping their teachers get up to speed over the summer. And I think that across the board, the, the quality has improved. Still, there's going to be a lot of variability. We're still, the, the teachers are still doing this on the fly with, without, you know, as Peggy said, without enough resources, without enough any per specific training. We're learning so much and we're going to f pull from this experience a lot of best practices going forward. Um, but it is it is a big challenge. Thank you, Devin. Back yes, to- I, I would like to just add Sorry, one, one yeah. little note to that. Um, thank you very much for what you just said. I think uh, for young children, um, particularly those in say the three to six or three, even, even three to eight age range, uh, we may also have right in our Beth Elm congregation, a great resource. And this is older teenagers and young uh, adults, college age students uh, who could become Zoom buddies or Zoom coaches so that children can benefit from interaction with, with young adults that they look up to uh, that we know are gonna be super responsible um, and parents can get some respite from 24 seven care and education of young children, which does lead to emotional exhaustion. So just wanna kind of put that idea out there. That's great, good idea. Dr. Dehovitz, back to vaccines. Again, from Dr. Jeff uh, Berman, if you get the vaccine, will you be infectious to other people? No, it is a 
it's a killed vaccine, or not a kill, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a protein, it's an mRNA, there's nothing infectious in it, so you won't be infectious to other people because it, there's nothing live in, in, in the vaccine for that to happen. So, um, uh, so there's no problem being around other people after the vaccine. Uh, for you again, uh, Audrey Adelson asks, are there any contraindications in taking vaccine? Well, we're oh, going to Audrey, know- That's actually Audrey Smith, I'm sorry. Oh. We're going to know this week when the EUA comes out exactly what, if there are any restrictions around the vaccine at all. There, the debate had been, what are they going to say about pregnant women? What are they going to say about lactating women? What are they going to say about children? Because this has not been studied in anybody under 16, I don't think the vaccine will be approved for anybody under 16. I think um, they'll probably say not, um, not, they'll probably say that it's not approved for pregnancy. Um, although there's some debate about that, and some actually groups are suggesting that it's okay, um, uh, and they'll be having a pregnancy registry where they'll actually will be able to, to to monitor what happens in people who inadvertently who get the vaccine but then inadvertently uh, are pregnant with uh, and and um, didn't know that. And there's probably a thought that it'll be fine to give to to people who are uh, to women who are who are breastfeeding. But but there's a lot of we'll know more at the end of this week exactly what the re restrictions are. But um, other than that, most likely it'll be people above the age of 16 um, will be recommended to have it. Thank you. Um, again, to Peggy or Devon from uh, Irene Lefton, how will we track the longer term social impacts of the children and also adults? Will there be longer term studies to follow and address longer term challenges? Good question. So um, some of the research that we, you know, kind of quickly threw together um, that uh, where I, I have been learning about sleep habits and things like that um, comes from longitudinal studies that were already in place looking at adolescent development. Um, two national uh, NIH funded studies that one of which uh, includes over 11,000 participants um, Currently, they're about 12 to 13 years old. Uh, they're going to be studied for another at least seven years. Um, and so we're tapping into studies like that, um, simply modifying our surveys, adding questions. Uh, so we'll be able to continue doing that as the uh, pandemic continues, as it ends, and even long term, uh, looking for, uh, you know, correlation between whether it's contracting illness or social impacts from the illness, uh, all, all those different things. So there will be uh, a lot of studies that sort of a, were able to tack on COVID specific questionnaires and then follow that uh, going forward. So I think there will be a tremendous amount of information uh, coming about, about uh, around the impacts on children in, in all the different ways, whether it's the social development, um, sleep, uh, school start times, uh, physical health, all types of things. Uh, I'll just, uh, I think it's interesting probably because it's research that I do. One of the things that we do is um, we track sleep and activity using wearable technology. So basically Fitbits. Um, we happened to have had a bunch of those deployed right when the uh, first uh, shutdowns began. And so we're currently looking at the physical activity impacts. So we'll be able to see how active were kids, how many steps were they getting at school, and then what happened when we shut the schools down. We, I don't have that answer just yet. We will soon, um, and we'll be able to continue tracking that as things open up again. We'll we'll see how that changes. So so there's going to be a wealth of information um, out there, and and those are just a couple of studies I have intimate knowledge with. Um, I have lots and lots of colleagues who also were immediately sort of said, okay, how can we take advantage of this unique situation and created some really amazing data collection methods. So we will have a lot of knowledge about this uh, in time. Thank you, Devin. Uh, Devin, um, I, I, I haven't seen those studies yet and I hope that they will start very early. It's always a problem with longitudinal studies to get that to happen. So I hope that this will be different. If not, we as a congregation can approach our Congresswoman on an issue and ask her to push for this at the federal level. I wanna just mention 
that we are a privileged demographic, as stressed out as we are, and um, where we are going to see uh, really severe long-term impacts on kids uh, starting at very young ages is in our black and brown communities, particularly our low-income communities. They've not only had to deal with the pandemic and with much higher infection rates in their communities, uh, they are crammed, crammed and cramped into small dwellings. Uh, they can't get outside very much. Um, and many of them have had to witness on TV or in other places, the horrors of seeing black and brown men and women, uh, the uh, uh, objects of violence and police brutality. So we are very aware uh, that this is a population that is particularly vulnerable right now to massive long-term impacts. Thank you for that input, uh, Peggy. I want to remind everyone uh, as we're approaching nine o'clock, if you have a question, please put it in the chat and I'll get to it. Um, also, uh, the slides will be available at the end of this uh, in the chat function also. Uh, Sandy Spector asks uh, Dr. Dehovitz again about vaccines. So how did the study know that the participants who got the actual vaccine were actually exposed to COVID and therefore didn't get COVID because of the vaccine pr protection? Well, the, the vaccine, it's, it's, it's impossible for the vaccine to cause COVID because there's nothing live in the vaccine itself. And, uh, but I think what they did is they, every so many, every so often they would be checking in with all the vaccine participants. Neither, vaccine participants did not know if they had placebo or if they had um, uh, the, the, the active study vaccine. And so they would just check in with them every few days to see how they're doing, taking temperatures, reporting normal vital signs, and then uh, and then, as they reported getting ill over over time, that would be um, that'd be recorded and and put in the uh, in the database, so that when they actually did break the code to find out who was actually um, uh, who's, who actually was sick and who and who wasn't, uh, that's when it became clear that the that ninety five percent of the people who were sick were people who had the placebo. That's great. That that's all the questions that have come in. Um, and I want to thank you all for a great discussion of everyone. And this is being recorded, someone asked, um, and it's uh, mentioned in the chat, it'll probably be in the archives. Um, I think Rabbi Morrison wanted to round up the farewell. Thank you, Diana. Thank you for, for moderating all of this and, and uh, and to you, Lori, for, for ensuring that we got to this moment. This, this evening's been, a, 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 I would say, a couple months of process. Um, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to learn from you all. Uh, just, again, to speak personally, I usually at, Cog at Beth um, events, I need to deliver the content. So it's so great to, to hear of what you guys do in your day jobs and for all of us to really gain wisdom from all of you and from, from, from what, what you do and what you know. I'm sure we're all looking forward to the, to I hope the next, if not the next, but the one after that, the health initiative presentation that has nothing to do with COVID, that we're looking at this in the rear view. So, so, so we all look forward to that day. Um, I wanna wish you all, I want, so thank you all. I wanna wish everyone who's here a, an early happy Hanukkah. Uh, to say too that we're going to be lighting the candles together every night of Hanukkah at 6.15 on Zoom. Um, uh, a member of the clergy or program staff will be doing that. It's just a very brief moment of gathering every, every night of Hanukkah. Um, my family's going to kick it off on the first night of Hanukkah Thursday. And also to say that on Friday, because of 
of COVID and, and, and COVID-19 and the restrictions that, that we're now experiencing in this county. Um, we're, the clergy is gonna be leading Friday night services from our homes, but we're also going to be doing it on Zoom for everyone. So if you want to gather with us on Zoom as opposed to streaming it or, or what, what you've been experiencing most weeks is we, we kind of put it out there and we never see any of you. We'd be thrilled to be all together on Zoom and it'll give us an opportunity to interact with one another. So I, I do hope to see you there on, on Friday night. So take good care, everybody. Thank you again. And uh, and we'll we'll see each other very soon, I hope. Okay. Take care. Thank you, everyone.